good day, my Telos podcast friends. I've got a good one for you today. A cipher Glass recently became a block producer on Telos. What is the story behind that? What's their team up to? What's the future hold for Telos? We get into all that and more. This today's podcast is sponsored by Crown.club. Crown is building an interesting community. Check that out. I will send you some Crown tokens if you leave an interesting comment in the comment section. Also, this is coming from our sound engineer, Scott at Hybrid.games. He's building a really interesting out-of-the-box game at Hybrid.games, so check that out. Without further ado, I present to you the one and only Adriana Mendez and from the one and only Brock producer, Cypherglass. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain. The Talos Podcast. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Good day, my Telos Podcast friends. And Adriana, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Brandon. How are yeah, you? Absolutely. I'm doing great also. Um, it's a beautiful day. Um, so what's interesting going on in Telos for you right now? So Cypherglass, uh, we just launched our note on Telos. We're up and operating and accepting votes now. So go vote for us. That's the, the latest in, in our Telos news. We're super excited to be on Telos now. Um, it's something that I think we've been toying with for the last year or so. So now that we're up and, and running, please go vote for Cypherglass. Absolutely. And um, toying with it for the last year, uh, you've, uh, Cypherglass has done so much for the community. What's, uh, what's it looked like, kind of that transition, or what have you been thinking about toying with last year? So when Telos came up, you know, we, we had just launched EOS mainnet when the idea started floating around, and we definitely understood why that was um, a valuable idea. Um, when EOS was launched, we had this idea that there would be a lot more governance-related um, interactions with the chain, and that didn't necessarily happen. So Telos has always been on my personal radar as far as um, governance and pioneering new ways in blockchain to excuse me, uh, pioneering new ways to govern blockchains. So that for me is really why Telos um, is important and why we're adding it now. Um, you know, as a team, we kind of collectively decided that we wanted to really put our power into EOS mainnet and learn from it and grow from it. So we didn't add it right away. But now that we've learned and grown, um, you know, we're adding Telos into our, our portfolio, so to speak, and kind of diversifying out. Yeah, I what drew me to Telos as well is the is the governance, and I'm I'm a DPoS fan from you know BitShares to Steemit to EOS, and I just love the idea of humans interacting with blockchain. You know, that's kind of I think there's a, a big space there that um, that that needs to be filled. You know, it's it's cool to have the code is law, and that's a that's a great application, Bitcoin and ETH for things. Um, but I think there's definitely an application for this governance and this these humans getting involved. So. Um, yeah, that that's a. Uh, what's your what's kind of your favorite part of governance, or where do you see governance pushing blockchain? So, being an American citizen, I rely on a representative democracy here in the U.S., and I think that the U.S. has a reputation for being the beacon on the hill when it comes to democracy and pushing governance forward. So, I think naturally, I kind of have that instinct and that drive in me as an American citizen. And what I would like to see done with Telos is uh, use it as a discovery platform, as a use case, as a study tool for uh, representative democracies to use blockchain for their to run their infrastructure and to run voting and to run elections um, and to govern more locally in smaller communities. So for me personally, I think Telos has a lot of um, potential in that in that field in that market and as US regulations start to get passed especially with crypto 2020 coming up um, and just later this month I'll be at the future of money event um, where Dan's going to be speaking you know we see a lot of interest generated around um, cryptocurrency and blockchain right now so Telos is extremely well positioned to be in that limelight when things start to get passed and regulated um, you know me personally, I would love to see uh, a litigation and legal community form around Telos so that insight committees can start to put proposals forward and we can start to test these things on a much smaller and um, you know lower tier scale and have so many consequences if we do mess something up. 
So for me, TELUS just has so much potential to be a leader in that space. And I think that's why we're joining now because, um, you know, with Cypherglass, my agenda, part of my agenda will be to kind of push um, regulation and experiment, exper- experimental governance on blockchains like TELUS. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's cool. The, um, it's interesting to think about TELUS and where they fit into that. You, ta- you talked about the legal environment and it's kind of like you have EOS, um, the EOS chain in Washington pushing forward like directly with the government and working with them. Whereas Telo- TELUS did this interesting thing where they launched their chain um, to the community and basically there's no one to talk to about governance. So they kind of, they have the benefit of EOS pushing forward the, the, information with the government, but then they can kind of fly under the radar, see what happens, but also there's not necessarily some big target or someone for them to take down, which is, it's a cool spot to be while they experiment with that governance also, I think. I agree. I think they're a great candidate to base um, sandbox regulations on moving forward. Um, You know, I think that's what the rush is for regulation in the U.S. right now is we need this stuff regulated so that it can become serious financial tools and governance tools in um, in a wider range of markets. Um, Things like healthcare and litigation would greatly benefit from systems like USIO, but we can't do any of that yet because it's just so heavily under uh, under regulated and nobody will really touch it. So. Um, I think Telos, like I said, has positioned themselves so well for experimental value and use case value and study value. Um, you know, at Cypherglass, that's what we're going to be pushing for Telos is, is, hey, look at this really awesome project that has launched under um, not only current regulations, but the regula- helping new regulations push forward and, and be studied and optimized. So um, I think there's a ton of potential right there for TELUS to help drive U.S. regulations forward uh, as a use case and study tool. Mm-hmm. Do you have any specific areas you'd like to see regulation? Or you, do you have any specific areas that you think are kind of hot spots that are low-hanging fruit? I think low-hanging fruit for our community right now and what BPs and developers should be wrapping their minds around is low-tier organizational and governance tools and solutions. And what I mean by that is things like HOAs, um, even you know city councils, um, lower-tier government uh, organizations that do have need for things like tokenization and blockchain election voting. Um, so that we can begin to calibrate those solutions around our failures and, and you know, whatever is going to come up as we start to test it. But it won't have so much of a serious effect, like if we just launched it for the U.S. elections, so to speak. Um, you really have to test this stuff. It has to be put into an isolated environment and studied so that you know how it's going to affect the larger population on a greater scale when it comes to heavier decision making. So I think right now um, the exciting and and the exciting market and where the money is, is going to be in these low tier uh, software solutions that all of us as a, a community can kind of come together to help create. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a, uh, <clears throat> that, that's a great call because they, there needs to be some sort of experimentation. It's kind of like uh, these low tier government organizations are almost like an MVP for a lot of these products where you can't get it out, tinker around with it without these heavy consequences. So um, yeah, I think that's a great call. What uh, has Cypherglass uh, been working on any governance tools? It sounds like you're pretty interested in governance. Is there any governments, uh, governance tools on the back burner or being worked on currently? Um, so we do have some stuff on the back burner that I'm not at liberty to quite speak of yet, um, but there's all kinds of EOSIO chains and solutions popping up that we've been asked to um, consult on and be a part of designing. And we've definitely are lending our ears and our brains out to any projects that do need uh, infrastructure help or maybe business uh, business development help. Um, you know, our doors are always open. But me personally, I would like to see something like, um, you know, we launched Glass on EOS last year and it was a great tool. It was a fantastic monitor. And I'd like us to continue pushing glass forward and maybe turn it into a real world kind of SaaS solution. Um, so, you know, we're just experimenting right now. We're, we're trying to, to open up as many possibilities and explore as many opportunities as we can. I don't know that we've found something super concrete to keep exploring, but as my interest in, in blockchain and governance keeps developing, I'm sure we're going to stumble on something. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell people what Glass is and, and maybe what, what you're, how you're looking to expand it? 
Definitely. So Glass, when we launched it, was meant to be a BP monitoring tool. And what it did was help you identify where BPs were running their nodes, um, you know, what kinds of what kind of infrastructure they were running, and just provided a layer of transparency where BPs were concerned in in areas that we felt mattered a little bit more than say, um, you know, who your CEO is or things that were more reputational driven. We wanted to be a lot more um, numbers driven and, and concrete driven. So we were looking at things like, you know, were you running a hybrid infrastructure? Are you running bare metal? Um, and things that were contributing to the overall health of the network, like um, what was the geographical disparity of the network at that specific moment in that specific block so that, um, you know, any bad actors were easier to identify. And I think a tool like that um, has a use case to be turned into so many different kinds of monitors for, like I was talking about, lower tier government organizations. So um, I think we're going to continue to kind of circle around that idea until something, um, you know, with a little bit more meat on the bone comes around. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I was just, uh, I was looking at your Twitter recently. I saw a something that you retweeted and then I retweeted again. It was from uh, Steve Jobs talking about... Um, technology and these big shifts in technology and talking about the to boil it down he says basically you need to start with the customer experience uh before any new talk uh excuse me any new tech kind of gets adopted um where do you see where do you see customer experience with telos right now and where do you think there's some inroads to be made there so if i had to put it on a scale or a spectrum you know from you know really, really good interface to really, really bad interface, 10 to 1. I'd say that overall, um, as a community, blockchain and cryptocurrency is still at a 1. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, and I mean that with all respect possible, because I think five years ago, we were at a 0. Mm -hmm. um, so, so we're moving forward slowly but surely. But this is definitely emerging tech. And that specific tweet that you're, uh, you're talking about was definitely in spirit of this very topic, which is, Everyone, you know, that's having an identity crisis right now, that's capitulating, that's selling out, that's dropping their DP. Um, I hope that it gives them a little bit more faith and a little, you know, just to push on a little bit longer, because I think in emerging tech, we are going to experience these violent swings of volatility in, in, in faith, just in general. Um, and I think we're in one of those right now where we launched EOS, we didn't really get the outcome that we thought we were going to, but there's so much to be learned and gained from that um, to be able to continue to push forward. And I know that for me, um, even having Rob, you know, say I'm, I'm leaving, I'm getting out was a really difficult moment for me. Um, but since then, I've trained myself to look at just the just the facts. And the facts of the matter are that EOSIO side chains are, um, you know, the best bet right now for me personally. They continue to outperform um, in usability, in in governance, in in uh, applications. They just seem to work. Whereas I think the rest of the blockchain and crypto community are experiencing a lot of thresholds in those areas. So for me, the faith lies in the software, and because Telos runs on that very sophisticated uh, software that has the best chance of surviving all of these, um, you know, these complications and roadblocks. That's why I'm committing myself to these chains. That's why Cypherglass is doing this because I think it's where um, I'm going to get the most ROI on my time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it's uh, it helps to be. I, I mean, I kudos to. <clears throat> I know that it's tough to probably kind of change your branding or your message because it started as EOS, which was a and you know we're going to be EOS specific, which makes a lot of sense. I mean, from a from the beginning, that's kind of what made sense. And that's, that's where I was at as well. Um, but as you see the tech develop and as you see um, the, 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 the landscape changes. And so kudos to you for being nimble and, and kind of taking on that, that change. Um, yeah. So yeah. yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say kudos, kudos back at you and kudos to everybody still engaged and still watching and still, mm -hmm. um, you know, discussing because it takes, you guys, it takes all of us to kind of keep the faith going. So, um, you know, I wouldn't be getting the kudos if it wasn't for you guys still mm -hmm. believing and building on this stuff. So thank you to everyone who's participating still. It, it really does mean a lot and it helps. So please keep doing it. <laughs> yeah, it, it is a, um, this is a, a definitely, a, it feels a downtime. And I would almost, have you, I'm sure you've seen the, um, 
the the tech cycle, like the tech startup cycle um, thing. Yeah. And it feels like we're we're like nearing that pit of despair area at the bottom. Uh, for anyone, I'll just quickly recap. It's kind of like starting a new company. You have euphoria and kind of these feelings leading up. And then as it gets kind of older and you hit roadblocks, it starts this downhill until you're at like a pit of despair where uh, you're just looking for anything to hold on to. And then you kind of climb out of that before some <laughs> sort of exponential um, success. But uh, but yeah, it definitely feels like uh, we've we've worn, a, we've, we've taken a lot of punches right now. And uh, yeah. But uh, have faith in that, that that's the process uh, it, with all this emerging tech. It's such a, and, and I'm, I imagine yourself, well, let's talk about how you've been traveling around Asia and things that you've learned because um, one of the things that uh, startups are able to hold on to when, uh, when it's that slog, that tough time is um, all the things that they're learning because whether you're successful or not, uh, you're building this bag of tricks, we'll say, where uh, where you can be successful in any kind of tech. So what has traveling around Asia taught you about kind of the tech world? So yeah, when I first got started with Cypherglass, I decided um, with the remote position, it was best that I actually got out into the world and experience both the EOS and um, FinTech community firsthand. And since we were going to be launching a global decentralized network, um, you know, I wanted to get get all around the world and Southeast Asia ended up being my favorite region, my favorite place to kind of um, discover new ideas and new technologies. And it seems like EOSIO was really hitting the nail on the head when it comes um, comes to what these technologies are going to need and require to, to stand up and, and be functional. You know, um, there's this, there's this huge idea right now that EOSIO could really replace MySQL, and that was the largest topic that I found um, EOSIO to be in contention with out in Southeast Asia. You know, that's what EOSIO was being talked about. Is it a replacement for something like MySQL? Is it going to be the driving database of the new of the new internet? And um, the answer was yes for them. You know, I had plenty of real, um, you know, real founders, real company owners, people who were um, actually interested in building on this stuff. But, you know, time after time, I kept hearing, it's still too soon. It's still too soon. And it's true. It's still too soon. We're only, we're less than two years into the development of this software. And even though Black One has just done an amazing job outpacing and outrunning anybody in competition with them, it the fact still remains that this stuff isn't ready for prime time use. And I think that's what people in Southeast Asia are waiting on is prime time use because there's tons of DeFi projects going on out there because there's an actual need for them in that market. You know, in Southeast Asia, my money doesn't seamlessly cross borders. There isn't ATMs on every corner. It's it's a whole different um, you know experience in the finance world, especially just one-on-one -on -one individuals. So there is a need for this kind of technology out in Southeast Asia. And I think that um, they're smart enough to recognize the opportunity in EOS, which is why so many uh, Asian investors are are invested in EOS, they're holding it, um, and, and they're building on it. Yeah, I think that um, that lack of infrastructure you're talking about in, in finance is something that sometimes really drives um, drives new adoption. Like you look at the Africa in Africa, how they basically leapfrogged PCs and laptops and went straight to mobile because the infrastructure wasn't there. Um, and so it actually jumped them ahead in the mobile game. And maybe we're seeing something like that in, uh, in Asia with DeFi. Um, I think so. Yeah. What is kind of, what's the, um, feeling boots on the ground or what, what, um, cryptos do you see them using and involved involved with is it a lot of EOS IO or is it kind of all over the board or what's that look like it's kind of all over the board and what I've noticed with cryptocurrency in general um, is that we all kind of have a regional market so to speak that's kind of like these bubbles regionally EOS is so well distributed globally in my opinion when it uh, you know in comparison to other projects things like Bitcoin and Ethereum are, are global obviously I think people uh, out there are really excited about things like MakerDAO um, which is which is really awesome to see because that is a pure DeFi project and that parallels very well with, with what's going on in EOS right now and uh, you know EOSIO and Telos in general. We're seeing new DeFi tools pop up and DeFi being one of the heaviest discussed items in our community and things like equilibrium are are going to quickly catch up to things like MakerDAO, in my opinion for the simple fact that the software is better um so right now i think MakerDAO is really big in southeast asia uh omg is really big out there 
um, Z coin, Monero, kind of all of your regular top 20 outfits. Um, but they love stable coins too. So I think something like EOSDT stands a good chance of being used if they can get dApps to build on them and use them as, um, you know, use them as a peg. So right now it's uh, it's a free market. It's anybody's game. What's the, what's the government regulation like out there that you, did you come into contact with any of that? Yeah. So um, I spent some time in Thailand. Actually, I was in Thailand the longest, um, you know, did Vietnam and Thailand. But Thailand has a fantastic sandbox regulation where as long as you are upfront about what you're doing and you operate on uh, existing financial protocols, calls of running a company, then you're safe. So they have a very tell us what you're doing and you can do it kind of mentality, which is interesting to see because they are governed under a monarchy. Normally you would think that that would cause a lot of contention, but they see a lot of promise in the technology to uh, help out their their ecosystem and help out their GDP overall. So um, fantastic regulations going on in, in Thailand. I was privileged enough to attend some of the digital, um, the Ministry of Digital Economics um, uh, town hall meetings kind of, I, I'm not sure what they call them there, but you know, I was able to sit down and cryptocurrency was a topic that came you know, it was brought up time and time again. So they're definitely circling in on it. And I think um, you'll, you'll see it widely adopted out there. Vietnam is awesome because they're a crypto DMZ. You can go out there, take your project. And as long as you tell them that you're operating there, um, you, you can pretty much launch any project. It does make it a scarier environment, more of a wild west, um, because you can get scammed. But if you're a lover of free market solutions and free markets in general, Southeast Asia is probably where you should be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cool. Um, do you have plans to go back out there or um, or do you think you're going to stay U.S. based at this point? Um, so right now I'm going to keep myself U.S. based. Uh, I would love to go back out there. But right now I actually think that the market for EOSIO is here since um, you know U.S. regulations are coming out. So I'm going to keep myself here and see if there's any chance of um, getting some pilot programs up and going in the U.S. soon. Cool. So what's on the um, what what's Cypherglass currently up to? Um, so Cypherglass right now, I'm not sure where we sit on the board, but you know, as a company, we're just we're focused on our infrastructure and campaigning. Still, okay. same two things, um, not just for Telos, not just for EOS, but we'll be you know adding other EOS IO chains coming up. So you can definitely look for us, uh, you know, look for some updates there. And um, I think we're going to be starting a new series of some YouTube videos. So those will be coming out soon. So any ideas, please uh, please send them to my Twitter. <laughs> Cool. And YouTube, that's that's always good. Uh, classic Cypherglass has some of the best classically YouTube videos for sure. So that's cool to see that continuing. What's that going to look like? Are you going to be doing YouTube? Is uh, our Rob and um, the team going to yeah. be helping out or how's that? What's that look like? So I'll be uh, taking over our YouTube, kind of taking over Rob's position on that. I don't know that they'll be as frequent because um, you know Rob had a whole studio set up. I don't know if people realize how much work go into those videos, oh, yeah. but it's quite a bit. Um, so I'm going to, you know, I'll be putting out some videos on topics that I want to see discussed, but I don't know if it'll be as frequent as, uh, when Rob was around and I am definitely looking to, uh, put it, maybe put out some video bounties and have the community get more involved in our YouTube channel. So that may be something that you see come out from us. Maybe we'll put out a, you know, a 40 EOS campaign and, and, and bounty for a couple of videos to put out. So. That's what cool. we've got coming up. <laughs> and do you have a uh, marketing background, social media background? And uh, is that kind of, was that kind of your inroads to uh, to the team in the first place? Yeah. So Rob found me through a hem hunter. I had already kind of been blogging and experimenting in the crypto space, been involved since 2015 um, and, and just had a love for blockchain governance from the very beginning. But for me, yeah, it's been mostly social media and data analytics. That's kind of my background, um, business development, so to speak. So um, it is kind of interesting coming from head of community to CEO. It's definitely a transition. But um, as I'm learning and discovering about myself, apparently I did have the entrepreneur bug and, and this is really fitting and I'm still really, really passionate about the space. So good things to come. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's a that's a killer transition. I mean, coming from uh, coming from the uh, the community aspect. I mean, that's what a lot of uh, crypto is right now. It's all built around community. Yeah. So it's a it's a really logical transition, I think, for sure. Yeah, um, it's made a lot of sense. Yeah. So what who's on your team now? And what's um, what's that look like? 
So um, pretty much the original core team is still here. It's myself, uh, James Sutherland, who is our principal architect, and Ross uh, Holman, who is our head of technology. Um, ben Finch is still on our team, but he has, um, you know, he's taking less of an active role. He's our head of marketing. He's still advising me kind of on a high level on how to, you know, keep moving things forward, which I'm very, very grateful for. But as of right now, it's the, uh, it's the original four, and we're just, we're, you know, we're just kind of pumping along. Um, and I'm kind of fielding all of our, you know, marketing and, and strategy needs right now. So we're a slim and small team, but hopefully that'll change as the markets start to grow. Cool. And what's your infrastructure look like uh, in compared to the EOS um, infrastructure? I know that it's been very robust. Yeah. So we have uh, two dedicated bare metal servers. They're both in the U.S. One is in New York and the other is in L.A. Um, and, and that's how we, we've we always typically functioned is bare metal. Um, and I think that's how we'll continue to function. And both of our both of our nodes are run by James. Um, you know, he has an isolated environment for both of them and, and main, you know, see, sees to them all day long as, as you would children, basically. Um, so we are, we're really dedicated to that. Um, that's kind of where I think Cypher Glass's passion comes from is these two guys where, you know, they see tons of opportunities to innovate on their own skill sets and they have some great skill sets. You know, they've both been in the game now for, I think, a total 30 years. And, um, and continue to see opportunities and, and assist in ways that, that, that um, you know, really optimize these networks. Nice. Um, so as uh, for, as Cypher Glass, what, what, um, what chains are you interested in? What other chains do you think showing a lot of promise right now that you're kind of starting to research? Um, so Wax. Wax has been on the tip of my tongue now for the last two months as I've watched them get their project rolling. It's been very impressive. Um, you know, they are really good at executing. They are very good at relaying information. And I think Quigley's content is some of the best blockchain content in the game. He does an excellent job of reaching audience outside of EOS and dragging other, other community members into uh, our little safe space. Um, and, and I think that team just has so much to offer in terms of experience and uh, understanding where this stuff is truly um, important to use. So for me, Wax is at the top of my list. Now, after that, I would say FIO, um, Luke, which Luke Stokes is heading up. So I think that, um, you know, no matter how hard they try, they couldn't mess it up because mm -hmm. Luke, is, is, Luke is a legend a guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, I am looking forward to getting Fios test that up and running in February as well. And then after that, we will see. We're still on the lookout for any other new opportunities. So if you are launching a blockchain, let us know. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, the cool thing about Wax is we were talking about the UX a little earlier. It's almost like they have this real natural UX inroads because of the whole video game thing. And yeah. all they have to do is like kind of attach blockchain to a video game somewhere, somehow. And like the UX just takes care of itself. The, the UX is the video game kind of, and you just hide blockchain in there somewhere. You're crushing it. So um, I think it would be super cool to see. So like you have Ultra coming out too, which I didn't even mention, which does definitely deserves some some honorable mention. Ultra getting somebody like Ubisoft involved as a validator. That's a huge opportunity. And and just those um, you know those crossroads create tons of business opportunities for maybe even something like Wax and Ultra to end up working together because they're blockchains that are serving different functions but in the same you know in the same market. Mm -hmm. So um, you know Wax being that super into intuitive kind of marketplace for, for NFTs and gaming. Um, I could see something like Ultra saying, well, we're going to just tack this on because these two chains are compatible, being that they're both built on EOS IO. So there's this world of opportunity for all of these chains to end up working together instead of being competition. And I'm really excited to see how that plays out over the next year. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting Part I haven't given much thought to, but um, you think about when the internet came out and there's all these little startups and and all of them kind of started like merging together into one blog right. and then eventually became Google and, uh, you know, and Facebook. Right. But, but like, yeah, we're definitely at this point where it's just a, like a million little projects, but they will start strategic partnerships and growing and becoming um, much more substantial. Uh, that, that, that's an interesting way to think of it. Hmm. Yeah, it's like Legos, right? We're just connecting. Yeah, exactly. Connecting a bunch of stuff. 
Do you hear much about uh, Tron when you're out in uh, Asia? Or Southeast Asia? Uh, I actually had the privilege of meeting Justin Sun while oh, cool. I was at um, the Blockchain Summit in Taiwan. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the technologies of Tron and, and where he sees those things going. And I think that Tron has done an amazing job of capturing the market and building a well and creating a development environment that um, rather than uh, talking down about them, I'm going to praise them and, and say we have a lot to learn from that community because they've been able to field FUD and, and um, you know, negligence and, and haters a little bit better than I think our community has and turn it into positive reinforcement and spin it a little bit better. So I think that Tron, while the technology isn't as superior as something like EOSIO, I think we have a lot to learn on, uh, from them from the optics side and the external facing side. Mm -hmm. So um, I will give that project kudos where, you know, marketing and business strategy and, um, you know, developer, development is concerned. But um, as far as I'm concerned, EOSIO has kind of taken up the whole of my, um, you know, my mental bandwidth, so to speak. <laughs> Every day, there's so much to learn about it that I'm just gobbling up information uh, in this one specialized field. So, um, you know, Tron, while I wish it the best of luck, isn't hasn't caught a whole bunch of my attention quite yet. Well, likewise, it hasn't caught much of my attention yet either. That's why I like I asked. I was like, hopefully, I'll find out. I can take a shortcut here and, and ask <laughs> someone else for the notes on Tron because I haven't. Uh, you know, there's like you said, there's so much going on just in EOSIO. I mean, just in Telos, there's so much going on that it's like it's hard to to keep up to date. But then really you add is. in EOS, which is huge, and Wax, which I'm interested in, and the links, and I mean, it's just like okay, this is yeah, yeah. I've got a full time job keeping up just EOSIO here for sure. I think I think somebody in the EOS community, and maybe that's you, maybe that's me, maybe that's one of us, but I think somebody would do really well to maybe start a channel or start a segment where where we start to um, involve other chains and start to open up our, our you know, knowledge base. Because for me, um, since joining Cypherglass and being in the EOS IO community, I haven't had time to really dive into what's been going on in the Lightning Network or what's going on mm -hmm. in Ethereum. And even though those are direct competitions to our software, I think learning about them is so important. So uh, content idea for someone out there, maybe put together a, you know, a quick five minute spiel of what's going on in the other chains, because I think our community could benefit from, from that. Yeah, there was a, there was interesting talk. I didn't, I just real cursory knowledge of it, but they were talking about essentially like putting uh, Bitcoin transactions on EOS IO software, like kind of like facilitating a lightweight nighting network type of thing. Um, so yeah. yeah, anyway, yeah, I think there's probably some, um, there's going to be some crossovers at some point between all this tech. So it's, it's, uh, it, yeah. it would be cool for someone to, uh, be covering that a little bit. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, have you had any, um, experience or any thoughts on DAX at this point? Uh, DAX are super interesting to me. I think they are the perfect example of decentralized governance, how how companies can work together using the same information, but not necessarily, sh um, you know, each contractor not necessarily sharing their secret sauce or giving away their ideas. I think that DAX exists now in everyday business. Um, you know, Cyberglass is kind of run like a DAC when I think about it, because you've got this core LLC, and then we're all contracted to that LLC. So we're all our own individual business within Cyberglass. Um, and I think that's what a DAC is. A DAC is just a way to come together and say, we're all working together and we all have these departments that we're not going to necessarily share the same um, litigation or, um, you know, economic or financial principles. So we can all kind of operate under our own terms. I think DACs are super interesting um, right now with the U.S. economy and where it's six. And I'm hoping that with regulation, we can actually see some pop up in local cities and, and start to create a job opportunity for people because that's what I think ultimately they could be used for. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And shout out to Crown DAC. I like to mention them and uh, every time I talk about DACs. But yeah, that's that's another whole little world of its own. I mean, you can go down just the the decentralized autonomous corporation rabbit hole full-time basically. And that's just like this one little you mm -hmm. know, part. So um, yeah, very, very interesting. So um, bigger picture, we'll zoom out a little bit. What do you see for, or what's kind of the, the game plan for Cypher Glass five years from now? Where do you see blockchain maybe five or 10 years from now? What, what's, what do you see longer term? 
Um, so for Cypher Glass as a whole, when I zoom out, um, I can imagine tons of things I can daydream on you know, all day long. Um, for me, I would love to see us utilize and leverage all of our experience with EOS IO against, you know, future contracts with enterprises who want to build independent networks to replace AWS or, you know, want to experiment in building maybe um, a SaaS product for, for a problem they think needs solving in their specific market. And what I want Cyberglass to be is this well of information for politicians, for um, founders, business owners, DAP developers to come to and say, we're really interested in the technology that Block One is developing because they're doing such an amazing job. They're so well-funded. We know it's going to be around. We want to use this this technology on our product, how do we do that? And that's where I'm positioning us right now is in the future, I want us to, um, I mean, to be a go-to source in the U.S. There's only a handful of um, block producers that are held in the U.S. So I think that's why for me holding on to the node is so important and valuable is it's going to showcase that we have the experience with this technology and software to really make um, real world ideas and solutions come to life. Yeah, that's a, that's a great take. So, um, I'm sure that some businesses and people outside blockchain have come to you and asked for advice or consulting. What type of questions do you get from those people that are newer to blockchain? Yeah. So a lot of times I get someone that's like, Mm -hmm. look, my niece and nephew or my, you know, my executive assistant or, you know, a younger person has come to them and said, Hey, I understand this. I understand blockchain and you can leverage it for your own gain. Um, and they ask me, is that true? You know, can I use blockchain? Can I use this as a database? Can I use this as, you know, anywhere in my everyday business to maybe cut costs, create job opportunities, or to solve a business problem? And the answer is typically yes. So for right now, I'm noticing a trend in the supply chain uh, world, in the gaming industry, um, two very hot, you know, hot topic areas that blockchain could really help solve um, a lot of issues and make things more transparent. So right now, um, you know, just fielding opportunities seems to be the name of the game and creating new opportunities as well and and not being afraid to pick up the phone and cold call some places that I think could definitely benefit from this. And that's what you're going to see from BPs. I think right now, at least good BPs, you're going to see good BPs getting involved with their local governments or, or local charities to solve a problem using EOSIO. So that's what I'm really focused on doing right now. Yeah. And the, the <clears throat> excuse me, one of the main ideas of block producers since the beginning was that the block rewards are just one small source of income. If you want to be a block producer, it's going to take basically uh, diversifying and having multiple streams of income. And so, so what you're doing seems like the, is definitely the right approach. Um, So yeah, that's good. Good vision. Um, Yeah. yeah. So what, um, what's in the near, the near future, what do you've got on the plate for the next month or so? Yeah. So this week I'll actually be flying out to DC to be present for the GBA uh, uh, government blockchain associations, uh, you know, big talk on Capitol Hill. I'm really, really excited about that. I'm going to get to meet up with some of my, you know, my EOS buddies. Um, I believe Dappiness, uh, EOS Costa Rica, EOS Detroit, all of these people are going to be making the trip out there. So I'm super excited to see these guys and to hear what Dan and um, a bunch of these politicians like Amelia Powers from Wyoming talk about their experiences using blockchain and see what I can kind of absorb and learn um, to bring back to the EOS community as a strategy of how we get our software um, maybe into the into the doorsteps of the U.S. government. You know, that's for me priority number one right now. Um, is making this a, a real live tool that's used by our, you know, our own government. Um, and then after that, I'm going to be uh, back in San Antonio getting ready for voice beta launch. That's yeah, going to be the big, the big exciting one for February. Yeah. Um, you talked about the, uh, the government possibly using EOSIO. You, where's the low hanging fruit in that situation? Where do you think maybe an inroad would be? So an inroad there is partnering with a politician who's willing to use EOSIO to in, in some capacity. And I think something like um, registering marriage certificates, registering property and, and, and land registration, 
those are low hanging fruit, I think, mm -hmm. um, because they're isolated, they can be controlled and maintained very well, and don't have a lot of consequence if something goes wrong, because current systems are in place that we can continue using while we test these, while we calibrate these new ones. So I think low, low, low tier fruit is, um, you know, cer certificate validation, I guess is the right word for that. Yeah. Okay. That, that makes sense. Well, uh, I wish you the best of luck there. That's cool. I, uh, you know, the, uh, and, and blockchain from, from our standpoint seems so logical for things like voting, but obviously it needs to be scaled up. So there's no mistakes along the way. But, uh, I was listening to a podcast the other day and they're talking about, you know, the, the pitfalls of electronic voting and how people are hacking it and this and that. And they're talking about going back to back to paper. Yeah. They're like, the only thing we can do is go back to paper. Um, I think long-term that's a good <laughs> sign. Yeah. Long-term that's a good sign. They're like, they're, they're saying, okay, we got to abandon this. We got to go back to paper. I think that it, it may take 10 years or so, but, but at some point it's going to kind of slip in there that blockchain is kind of like paper, you know, except for better. <laughs> it's a little bit better. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Cause I think, um, I think where we're at our economy and our government needs an overhaul from, the 18th century to the 21st. And I think that's yeah, what absolutely. blockchain can be used the most, of, you know, if we're going to use it for one thing, that's what we need to use it for. I was talking with a uh, uh, voting, I think someone from Honduras, uh, but uh, they were talking about the voting system and essentially what happens with the paper votes is uh, they come in and then they get, uh, they come to one place and those votes get uh, collated and then they basically put on a tab like you know 1500 and a thousand and then all those tabs go to one place and what happens is yeah. um, as the tabs go to the final tabulation those they change the numbers get changed so like you know it, there's there's like these parts that you think about oh paper's so secure well it's still just you know there's some sort of handoff there where someone has the votes right. that they, you know so yeah well, you, you're just, you know, you're describing double entry accounting versus triple entry accounting. Mm -hmm. And, and I think very few people really understand how elegant the solution uh, between the two is where you're talking about time stamping an entry and not time stamping an entry mm -hmm. in between the two and, and tying that transaction to each other. Um, you know, that's exactly what this is supposed to solve is exactly what you just described where we have paper incoming and no way to track it each individual time. You have to have accountability on so many levels of who entered the vote, where did they enter the vote? How did the vote get from point A to point B? There's so many validation checks that the natural solution here is blockchain technology to be able to provide that timestamp on every single trans you know, transaction. Um, so for me, the proof is in the pudding it, it clearly works but how do we explain it to the decision makers that can actually get it in the door? That seems yeah. to be the, the key we need to unlock. Mm -hmm. Well, that those first steps that uh, you're taking going to the uh, conference there and hopefully getting some, like you said, any sort of little foot in the door with one. Uh, <clears throat> the interesting things about politicians is they also have this incentive to make a name for themselves or have some sort of impact. And, yeah. you know, it, you, it's just going to take finding that one politician who's like, okay, I want to be the guy or girl who first brought blockchain to, you know, government, you know, that's like, that's kind of a historic uh, position to be in. So <laughs> huge selling point. Yeah. yeah. I think if we can <laughs> leverage politicians own vanity and need to get elected against them to get this in the door, then I think we're doing our jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, it's, it's exciting. Just the idea that uh, EOS, I saw, EOSIO software is in DC and in front of government and starting to be pushed forward is, is just an inspiring thought. So. Um, Agreed. Absolutely. So um, we talked about a lot here, but I think that um, one of the most interesting things is just for people to get to hear you and your take and Cypherglass direction and, um, you know, your thoughts on Telos and, and why you're here. I mean, this is um, this has been a really informative podcast. Do you have any uh, kind of final thoughts or any final topics that you'd like to talk about as we start to wind down here? You know, um, I think we've covered just about everything, but again, uh, for the second time, just want to send a sincere thank you to everyone out in the community, especially everybody that's reached out the last couple of weeks as I've been going through the transition. Um, everybody that's made it a little bit easier and helping me uh, get onboarded to uh, information I, I needed to be. Uh, thank you very much. And, and everyone's still voting and supporting Cypherglass, especially you today. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. 
Absolutely. Well, my Telos podcast friends, this is another tantalizing episode of the Telos podcast and uh, we'll be back soon. And uh, Adriana, it was great to see you today and uh, I wish you the best in DC soon. Thank you guys. Yeah, cheers. The money is not the prime asset in life. Time is the 